Um, yeah, so thank you for, for coming on today, and, and I will um, get on to, to Jenk and Josh um, shortly, but just briefly to introduce what we're going to be talking about today. I always find it slightly awkward when I get introduced to someone who's got my finger on the pulse of Gen Z, and then I'm sat next to Gen Z, who very much have their finger on the pulse, so hopefully we're getting a lot more insight from them. Um, touching on some things that Dylan, Dylan was saying, though, I just thought I'd give a real quick introduction to, to who I am and, and, and why a bit of fascinating, fascinating chatting to guys like this. So Dubit created the first flash-based 3D world some, some 20 years ago. Um, so in the time when, when MSN chat room, which I'm sure some of you remember, and was, was becoming a really big thing amongst kids. And this was, this was 20 years ago. Um, and MSN chat room wasn't designed for kids, but kids were going in there and kids were talking. Um, and things were happening in there that weren't necessarily appropriate for kids. So, you know, it, it kind of ended up getting pulled back a little bit. Um, and Dubit at the time, um, set up by 13, 14-year-olds, um, designed the the first flash-based virtual world called Dubit Chat, with the idea that being that kids would be going more and more into tech and using these, these kind of tech spaces to engage that needed to be more stimulating and more appropriate for kids. So being able to walk around as a 3D avatar was obviously incredibly appealing. Um, and we got half a million users in there, but, and this is touching again on what Dylan was saying, it was very, very early. So at that stage, parents weren't putting credit card details into in online. They just weren't doing that. Advertisers weren't looking at digital as a place to place content and talk to audiences. So even though we managed to kind of get this audience, scaling it into a, into a, into a business was very, very difficult at those early days. I think one of the chat rooms we had in there was, was by the government was actually called Drug Alley, which I don't think you get away with nowadays, where kids were able to go in and, and, and deal with those kind of issues that were relevant to their age. Um, now, fast forward 20 years, and as Dylan said, all of a sudden, 2017, 2018, we have incredible people. You know, uh, the Dubit board director, actually, in the Guinness Book of Records, being the youngest directors, which I think probably you could, you could take off them at some stage. So. Um, and, and, and now we're in a space where being able to build digital content, scale digital content, monetize digital content is obviously something which is, which is very relevant. As Dylan said, it's an incredibly exciting space to be involved in. Um, and today we've got two guys which are doing an amazing, amazing job of that. So um, getting their opinions is going to be going to be very, very interesting. Um, so very, very quickly, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the first thing we're, we're going to focus on is is how to make content, um, games, um, uh, uh, text content, um, and video content and commentary that actually engages this audience and, and, and creates a stickiness amongst this audience. Secondly, what that actually means then from a, from a scale perspective, how do you actually start to, to kind of bring people back? How do you start to grow audience? Um, then we'll look a little bit about monetization, um, specifically how these guys are, are kind of generating a, a business from, from this, this, this passion and interest that they have. And finally, we'll talk about moderation, uh, which obviously is going to be a big, big topic later on in the day as well. So before we get into those subjects, I'm going to let first Josh, who... Um, uh, develops games for Roblox and been doing it for a long time now. Um, t tell you a little bit about himself, and then Jenk will introduce I Call Kid. Hi, so I'm Josh. I develop games on Roblox. I've been playing Roblox since 2013. I first started playing with my friends. Thought, hey, this is cool. Then I discovered I could make games on the platform. Started learning to code, learning how to use the tools to make games. Um, after a couple of years, I have just created little projects. I decided to make a proper game. Uh, I ended up making a game called Farmulator, which is a farming simulator. Um, to date, that has about just over a million play sessions. Uh, I went on to make another event game for Roblox. A, I went on to make after that a, another game. And last year, I interned at Roblox, where I created a fourth game. And most recently, I created or was on the development team for the latest Roblox event, which launched at the end of March. And over the month it was live, it was played over 57 million times with 7.1 million play hours. Um, in, in amongst my game de development, I also go to university, and I'm in my first year, actually my second year in September. Uh, hi, I'm Jenk. I'm 13. I'm the founder and CEO of iCoolKid.com, as you can see just here. Uh, what is iCoolKid? Well, iCoolKid is four things. Firstly, publishing, digital publishing in the form of our website, and then print publishing in the form of our book. Uh, media, we have six social media platforms in which we curate our content. Uh, consulting, 
we're often consulted on Generation Z habits and purchasing habits and trends. And finally, production in the form of our YouTube channel and a TV show coming out soon. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> that's what they do. <laughs> um, so, Josh, first of all, just to, to talk about Roblox a little bit, because um, my generation, hearing someone just say, and I just started coding and developing, um, is very difficult to understand um, how it's just so easy just to pick that up and, and apply it. So, how did you how did you start developing? How did you how did you learn to code? What was your first steps? So, when I discovered I could make games in Roblox, I went and in, dived into the Roblox Studio, and Roblox has an amazing feature where when you create something, you can create a model, a script, part of a game, you can upload it to the library and make it available for anyone to use. So when I was making a game, I would look for something that somebody else had made and made free and put it in my game and try and make it work how I wanted. And at the time, I couldn't really script or code, so I would go in and see what they made and if I wanted a sword to do a bit more damage, I'd see, ah, oh, this number looks like it does have something to do with damage change it. If it worked, great. I'd remember for next time. And I just started going on from there. Um, I went on to use some Roblox tutorials on YouTube, which they'd made, just for the, the basics of coding. And Roblox has a great resource called the Roblox Wiki. And on the wiki, they have uh, every single item in the game and object which can be interacted and scripted. They have all the API for it, so that's all the events, the properties, everything that can be done with it in Roblox is listed on the wiki. So when I'd encounter something which I didn't know, I'd go onto the wiki and see how does this work and just go on from there. Um, and then, yeah, it was just trial and error. Uh, I'd go into the forums, see what people have made, and then, say, a month later, I'd see, oh, I need this thing. I saw someone do it. Let me go back and look at how they did it. And asking questions on the forums. Hey, I'm trying to do this. How do I do it? Um, yeah. So that's, yeah. So obviously Roblox provided with a lot of benefits that you wouldn't necessarily get if you weren't developing inside Roblox. Did you ever play with things outside of Roblox? And um, After I was on Roblox for a bit, I thought, let me go try other game development platforms. So I tried Unity, I tried Unreal Engine 4. Um, I, I, try, I, I didn't really find uh, such an area that you could get help from. There were forums which I could go to, but they weren't. They were a lot more geared for professionals and people who were already experienced in coding. And along with that, Roblox also provides all the back end, so that's databases, servers, server scaling, which is something extra that I have to do and have to learn. Whereas on Roblox, I can go in and create the game and not worry about, worry about oh, if I get a sudden influx of players, will my servers crash? What do I need to do to handle the database back end? I can just go directly in and make the game. Cool. What was the, the hardest thing for you to learn? Because obviously when you were developing, you had the, the community and the forums, but you weren't in a, in a work environment with colleagues to necessarily go for. Were there times when you got stuck? or? Yeah, so when I first started um, developing on Roblox, I used the, the experimental mode, where to give a brief overview, um, any computer connected to my game has access over the game. And that obviously poses a lot of problems. If someone exploits, they can put into the games, they can kill everyone repeatedly in the server, do a whole bunch of stuff. And my first games were used with that because it's a lot easier. And then when I started making my first game, my first proper game that went popular, um, I started learning the, the filtering system that Roblox uses and switched over to using that. And that took quite a while to learn. But now that I've learned it, I would never go back. Uh, it's just a lot more secure, and now that I know how to do it, it's, it's a lot easier. And I think one of the points that Dylan made at the end, um, wherever he's gone, I think is, is really relevant. We talked about the fact that a lot of these, these platforms weren't designed for this young audience. So YouTube and Facebook weren't native to, to this audience. Um, and now obviously Roblox is especially native to, to this audience and relevant to this audience. So what do you think is about Roblox and specifically about the, the, the content that you're creating that's allowed you to stay relevant for so long? Well, I think just to touch on Roblox, there's such a diverse amount of games on Roblox that you can literally go to the front page every day and there will be a few new games there that you've never played or seen before. And with regards to me, I think why my games are still played 
is because when I developed them, I was also, I was younger then for my first games, and I designed them mostly to be fun. Mm -hmm. So from the start, I'd think, what would I like to play? What would be fun to play? And I'd, I'd go into test something, and 10 minutes later, I realized, oh, it worked, but I'm actually playing the game. I should go back. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think that was definitely something that I designed them for fun. Yeah. Um, and because I was in the age range almost, it was a lot easier to make something which appealed to that age. Mm. And, and I mean, my, my job is, is to make sure that when our company develop products for kids, that we actually make sure kids and, and young people are at the centre of that design, so we have them in testing things all the time. How do you kind of get feedback and incorporate that into your design, or do you just launch it, see what the feedback is, and tweak, tweak once it's out there? Um, when I'm building the game, I'll generally have an idea what I'm doing, and along the way I may ask some friends or co-developers what they think of it. Um, but then once I've launched the game and I'm adding new features in, I generally go through a very short development process. So I'll have an idea for something, or somebody will suggest something. I'll make it, I'll get feedback on it. So I may even just publish it to a test server, get a few people playing it, get feedback, and then change it. Sometimes it'll stay the same. Sometimes I'll change it quite a lot. Um, based on what players' feedback is, and then I'll push it to the live game where everybody's playing it. Excellent, cool. Um, so, Jenk, moving on to you, how did you how did you get started? So, so what was that that point when you decided to start creating content and also I Call Kid as well? When did when did that happen? Uh, well, to cut a long story short, uh, every morning, Monday mornings, teacher would ask, "So, what did everyone do?" And I'd always say, "Oh, I went to go see this." Wicked. I went to go see Wicked, or I went to this DJ class, or I went to go do this. And it was always a bit out of the norm, because everyone else would always be, oh, I went to this football match or this rugby match. And then it got to the point where my friends were asking me, hey, Jenk, what are you doing this weekend? And then their parents started asking my mum, hi, Jenk's mum, what are you doing this? What are you doing this weekend? So that they could then come with me. My mum started then writing an email to those parents, and then those parents started writing an email to those parents, and then, then so on and so on. And my mum would go and see other friends from parents from school, and you'd have people from completely different schools saying, I know what your son's doing this weekend. And that was slightly creepy at first, but then I realized it was actually a really good idea, and we could make this a proper company. Uh, then I did a show and tell on it at the same school, and everyone loved it, and then it dawned on us that it was a very good idea. So then three years of website companies and deciding if we can actually do it. And then we said, yes, let's go. We chose a website company. We've stuck with them ever since. They're great. And then I Cook It happened. Excellent. So how, what was the show and tell when you went into the, into the kids in your classroom? What was the, what was the pitch at that stage? Uh, it was, it really hasn't changed much. I think the most biggest thing that's changed was probably the logo. It went from black, it went from, I think it was a white and a blue to yeah. black and yellow. And honestly, we've stuck with most of it since. We had our color-coded channels as we had then. We still have them now. We've had all the channels have stayed the same. All the whole concept has stayed the same. And it's actually quite nice to see that because you can see that little picture of eight-year-old Jenk with this big poster. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And, and why do you think this was, again, touching on, on the point that Dylan made about this, this being a time where people are creating content specifically for this audience digital, why do you think this was such a good time um, for I Call Kid to, to kind of grow. And obviously, it, it grew very naturally. You yeah. know, the, the class. Uh, well, well, well. <laughs> uh, tech was becoming three things. It was becoming, A, cheaper, more readily available, and easier to use. As a consequence of that, it was getting into the hands of much younger kids. With that tech came ads. So now, Generation Z were getting all of these ads. And whether they wanted it or not, they were subliminally taking in lots of information. To the point where... <laughs> To the point where my, I was seeing my six-year-old cousin, and she said, Jenk, have you been involved in an accident that it wasn't your fault? <laughs> and, then, and then recited the injury lawyers for you number off by heart. And I, upon further questioning, I realized that it was because she watched so much YouTube uh, that she'd seen this ad like thousands of times. And she didn't need it, I hope. Uh, <laughs> but it just, she memorized it. Yeah. And that's just, that just proves the point that, that you're taking in so much information that you won't necessarily need right now but because of the ads and you're seeing them, you're still taking that information in. Uh, then uh, social media was happening, mm. yeah. Uh, and then with social media, that meant that we were being able to use these ads and then say, hey guys, I'm off to Croatia because I've just seen an ad on for going to summer in Croatia. 
And then that social media was amplifying your opinions on Croatia, and then other people were figuring it out. So then they were getting that information from social media and ads. Well, then from that, we realized that Generation Z, with social media being the amplifier, was becoming a lot more outspoken and opinionated, but also have the knowledge to back that up because they'd seen so much ads, uh, so many ads. Then we realized that that was the tipping point. Uh, Generation Z uh, have an incredibly high soft spending power, so when uh, a allowance, which is hard spending power, added with when someone buys you something, that ends up to being about five trillion pounds a year, which is just mind blowing. So then we realized that we need, generate, we need to make a one-stop place for Generation Z to get all of their information, and that was like, oh, good. Cool, excellent. So obviously Josh was talking about the fact that he could lean into the Roblox community um, for, for his support. What, you, were, you were building on your own, and, and you, were, you were in this space on your own. Who, who were you going to for support on, on the content, on the business, on, on, on the ideas that you were having? Uh, well, at first, we had... So the way we get our content is through... We have all these push notifications set up. So on Facebook, you can we follow loads of these uh, brands, which then post, and then we learn about it. So then we say we get about 500 a day, and that's through all of our channels. Then we eliminate that down in a meeting to about 50, and then we use what's called the 10-second rule. So you start reading out a story, and if in 10 seconds someone in the room doesn't say, oh, that's really cool, then we don't post it, because then it won't be, oh, that's really cool, yeah. and that's what we want. Uh, so that's how we design our content, but then as well as that, also our community, as you were saying, because we have loads of social media followers, and then they are giving us content saying, hey, can you guys write about this? I don't know if I should do this. Can you please help me? Can you write about this? Tell me if it's cool. So then that's also another way of getting content to write about. Excellent. Cool. So having spoken about starting these companies and, and starting to grow audiences, at what stage did you realize that, I mean, we could talk about the number of, of social media followers and accounts you have and the number of people are using iCore Kids as well. At what stage did you realize that this was becoming something that was, that was, you know, more than just a site that was delivering content, actually a really legitimate business? Uh, well, it kind of, I'm not sure, because it, it, was, it was definitely wasn't like a, it, was, it definitely wasn't a clear divide. It was more, day one we realized, okay, we can do this. Day 100 we realized, oh, and it was at some point between one and 100. Yeah. <laughs> Quick question, fun. Do you still have as much fun doing it as you did when you, when you started? Oh, I still love it. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, Josh, from your perspective, you know, and obviously you've developed a few games for Roblox now, um, what, what was the moment when you realised that you were, you were good enough at this to actually, for it to become something that you could do for a profession? And um, as with Cenk, there wasn't really a, a set point, but when roughly about the time that I started making my, my first popular game, uh, Roblox launched the Developer Exchange Program. Because, uh, to give some background, on Roblox they have a currency called Robux, and players can purchase the currency, and then game developers can sell items or power-ups or whatever they want in their game in exchange for Robux. And then Roblox launched the Developer Exchange Program, which allows developers to exchange that Robux for dollars. So when I saw that come about, I was definitely a lot more interested, mm. and I started pursuing it a lot more. Um, then Roblox also increased the, the amount that you get for Robux, and recently, in the last couple of months, they did that again, which is great to see them building up on it. Um, but I think probably when I was busy on my third game, this was de it was definitely something when I took monetization a lot more into account. Mm. Um, as something that would that I could definitely improve on, and one day I could just work at doing games on Roblox as a job. Very cool. So I mean, I, obviously Dylan showed on his slide that Roblox is one of the the top games now for for these young audiences, and I'm assuming your your growth and audience has, has grown as as the Roblox kind of audience has become bigger and and more active. How how have you you kind of leveraged the new users as well as the the original people that were in Roblox? Yeah, definitely. So there are there were a lot of factors which encouraged that growth. Which also obviously as Roblox grew, my games became more popular as well. Um, to go to the fact of the new users to the older to the older users, the older users um, because they'd been playing for a while, 
say when they started, they were generally eight or ten, around the, the optimum Roblox age, the, the average rather. Um, now they're older, mm -hmm. so like Farmulator, that's slightly more complex. So it def definitely tends towards the older generations, yeah. or not rather older generations, but the older teenagers more. Um, and then, for instance, Island Empire, that's a lot simpler. That was my third game. It's a lot simpler, and it's um, in the same genre as a lot of other popular Roblox games. So because I've got the multiple games, I've got some which are more complex, which tend toward the older mm. players, with some which are a lot easier for the new players to just, they can just go in and play, and they'll probably know how to play since they've maybe played one or two similar games before this. So that's a, a really broad demographic. So how, how do you apply design? Obviously, it, it's easier to design something for someone your age and, and like you. How, how do you kind of uh, figure out how to build something for a seven, eight-year-old versus a, a 13, 14? What are the things that you change and, and tweak? Yeah, so I think it's also a lot to do with feedback. So I'll make something in the general design. I think it will work best. And then I'll ask users of different ages um, especially through Twitter. Yeah. What do you think of this? Um, and then I'll get a lot of people saying, hey, this works really well, I love it. And then I'll get younger users saying, oh, it was a bit complicated. Uh, I didn't know how it worked. And then if I get feedback like that, then I'll add a bit of a tutorial section for it or a bit more instruction. So I think it's a, it's a very iterative process for myself where I will develop something and then tweak it depending on what users say. I think that's the best way. Absolutely, yeah. And Cenk, what about you? So, I mean, obviously you have all this content going in there and, and all these audiences. So, you know, uh, how, how do you understand what your audience wants and how do you keep kind of creating that content that, that's, that's right for them? Uh, as I said, honestly, with social media, they're, I don't know if it's good or bad, but they are very happy to tell you what you're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And they're very willing to say, you know what? You Honestly, this isn't very interesting. And take it from me, because I am your age demographic. Uh, this is more interesting, write more about this, do less videos, do more pictures, do more photo editing on the pictures, uh, something along that. So honestly, it's just from our community and our fan base that we get most of our, lots of our feedback. And your, your demographic, how, what kind of age range and, and types of, of, of kind of people do you think are using? Uh, well, it's the main bit about Generation Z. So we say about 12 to 16, maybe 10 to 16. But then you have like eight year olds and you also have like 17 year olds. So we try and stick with that, but then also you're going to have a few people, others. See. And, and because the, the, the site's not that old yet, I mean, how, how is the, the difference between existing users? How much of your, your kind of user base is, is people who are coming back all the time, which obviously is, is hugely yeah. important versus, versus new users? Uh, honestly, it's a combo. I would say it's about half half. Uh, we have lots of people who are devout iCoolKid followers, iCoolKidders, yep. and they come back every day, see what's cool. But then also you have a lot of people from around the world saying, hey, I've just heard about this company via social media. What, what is it? Can I check it out? Cool. Um, and as for content, because obviously you're a, con uh, you know, you're, you're a publisher of content, so how, how do you check that content? There are two things, I guess. One for as you say, that, that 10 second rule, is it cool? And two for, in your opinion, the appropriateness of that content? Uh, well, every, we have our editor who goes through all of them. We have obviously our great content writers and they will, they just generally don't, because they're all original articles, so we write them ourselves. So it's less of a reading through each article and taking and not using it if that's something inappropriate, just writing it again and in I cool Kids style with the photos and the videos and stuff. Uh, but then obviously we'll always have someone who reads through every story and says, I don't like this, this video's not that suitable, and then just say, they, they won't always get rid of it, they'll just yeah. change it around. And what's the, the, the top trending, I know you're really into music, what's the top trending content that, that you have on the site? What performs really well? Uh, honestly, I think the most, my favourite on the, all the stories are Extreme Action page. It's just lots and lots of Red Bull and GoPro videos, and they're honestly incredible. But honestly, it depends, because you have people who love the pop culture, the brains and beers, the art and build, that's the one. Uh, it really depends on what you like. Okay. And how, obviously, Jenk's spoken a lot about social media. How are you, and, and you, you've been using the forums and, and, and communities, how do you use social media to, to raise awareness of the product and, and to also communicate to them you know, what, what you're trying to achieve? 
Yeah, so I generally use Twitter um, because I find a lot of the Roblox audience is on Twitter. Um, so I use that to, I will tweet, hey, there's a, I'm giving out a code for the game. And that will give you 100 cash, which will drive players to go play my game. Um, I publish updates. I put out polls. When I want to do a new feature, but I'm not sure what to work on, or I don't know how I want it to work, I'll put out a poll to see what my followers will want. And in, especially in Island Empire, I encourage people to follow me on Twitter for a reward in the game. Mm -hmm. um, so that it, it's kind of a, a loop. So players will play Island Empire, think, hey, I want this extra thing. Let me go follow him on Twitter. And then they'll follow me. And then a week later, I'll tweet out a code. And they'll say, hey, that's cool. Let me go back and play the game. Um, and then it will, it will go in a loop like that. So I, and I, I guess I think you're you're almost certainly the youngest people in, in this room. What's the, and, and, and we're all trying to develop good content, appropriate content for, for these age ranges. What's the, the, the one piece of advice you would, you would give to a room full of, of kind of tech and media people around creating content for, for, this, for the Gen Z demographic? Uh, around creating content? I think just stick to your demographic. And I think it's very easy for me because I am my age and I am perfectly in my demographic. But try and do your best to keep your ear to the ground around your demographic, which is why I always find it's really hard for uh, companies run by all adults to then work with uh, their companies that are based around kids. And I think that we've had such a great uh, opportunity to have people, to have me just in the, in the demographic and hearing what music you're listening to, what games you're playing, what are you up to? And it's really easy because then I can then report that back. And then they can say, okay, guys, no one's actually doing that. We should bring that down. Or, okay, lots of people are doing that. Bring more of that. Yeah. But it's def I think the one thing I say is just keep your ear to the ground around your demographic. What about you, Josh? Yeah, so as Cenk said, like, obviously keep your ear to the ground with the dem demographic. Um, for, for my part, like in games, I tend to find you've got a very short time span to get a player hooked on the game. Or just to get that little thing of, hey, this is fun. And once you get that little thing of, hey, this, this is fun, let, let me try, they, are, they will generally spend a, a more time, like I've had players like, play for 10 minutes, and then say, I don't know what's happening, I'm going to leave. Um, whereas I found older players will pl play, they'll join, after two minutes, they oh, I don't know what's happening, and they leave immediately. So once you, for me, I've found once you get the initial player to think, oh, this looks fun, even though they may be younger, they will definitely try and figure it out more, especially maybe growing up digital. They will figure out things a lot, lot quicker and try to get yeah. to know the game. Um, and just, we, we start to touch on monetization um, earlier in terms of the, the, the developer exchange program, which, which Roblox um, kind of put out there. What, what, um, how, did, how did you find that? How did, you, how did Roblox communicate that? How did you start first using that? Yeah, so it's a prevalent system in all Roblox games, really. So I was familiar with it from when I first started playing Roblox. So when I thought, okay, let me add it to my game, there was a lot of resources, especially on the wiki, on how to do it. Um, I tend to, in all my games, tend to focus purely on cosmetic items. So I, it's except in Formulator, which is predominantly single player. I try not to offer any items which will boost a player's um, base or their gameplay versus someone else just because they spent money. Because um, especially on Roblox, players tend not to like that. Mm -hmm. You'll get the players who will spend money to just purely to be better than other players. And then you'll lose players because they feel, well, I can't compete with this. Um, so I've tried to do everything cosmetic um, or things where it doesn't affect gameplay, but it's because kids like to show off yeah. when they get also like a new Supreme shirt, they'll, yeah. they'll go and wear that because they got it. So I try to like, I'll get, for instance, in Island Empire, you can buy emeralds or you can earn them in the game and you can use the emeralds to purchase um, cosmetic uh, upgrades for your machines. And players like that, they'll, if they can't, don't have Robux to do it, they'll go spend an hour collecting emeralds, mm -hmm. or you'll get the players who just want to get it now, and they'll, they'll buy it, and, and it works. 
And obviously we spoke uh, at the start about this being a good time for I Call Kids because of what was happening and how kids use media and also because of how, who wanted to communicate to this audience. I mean, Dylan spoke about the size of the advertising market to kids. I mean, that's obviously how, how you monetize. How, how did you start those conversations with advertisers and, and start thinking about how to place them on the site? Well, honestly, at the very beginning, we always had that idea of having ads on the website because it's just a necessity and it's that's one of the things you need. So you can see like the original wireframe. I've got photos on my phone yeah. and it's just it's like a white square and that says story. Yeah. And then it's like a white box and it says ads. And those are the uh, that was well, that was I cool kid at a point. It was just story ad. Yeah. And then so it, it was honestly one of the first things that we thought about. And it stuck with it, and then, so now you can go on iCook and you see you all the stories, and then you also have all of the ads. And then you think, I'm very happy that I thought of that, because having to come at it after a year of relaxing, we can make money from ads, then seeing, oh God, now we've got to change the whole layout because we've got stuff there and stories there and no ads there, but we can put ads there, it's just very confusing. Mm -hmm. So I was quite happy that we did ads at the very beginning. And have you seen a change in the effectiveness of the, the advertising on the site, and also how, how you put present the advertising, has that, has that changed as you've been doing it, or have you stayed felt relatively consistent? Uh, no, it's stayed quite consistent. I mean, obviously you have like waves, uh, but it's generally stayed quite consistent. And, what, and, and when it comes to choosing the brands and the content that you allow from a commercial perspective to be on there, what, what kind of decisions do you make? Uh, this was quite a hard. This was quite a hard process because it's almost like a game, like you have like a hundred different types of ads that you can go. So obviously we want to keep like the ones that are closestly, uh, closest, that's not a word, closest to our, what our demographic likes and what we write about on like cool kid. So for instance, I always like it when we see like, here's a gaming story and then here you have an ad for a racer computer, like a gaming computer. Yeah. And I think that's perfect. But then you like, you have really weird examples and I think that's not what you want. So you have like a hundred designated points and you have a hundred things and you say, here you can only eliminate a few and then you have to eliminate them. And then you kind of have these weird, like here you can have a trip to Croatia or you can on like a, you know, on a story about like extreme sports, which it doesn't quite correlate, yeah. but you think that's kind of how it works. And also if you don't eliminate, if you eliminate too many, you just start to have these weird blank spaces where ads would go, but you haven't got any ads. Mm -hmm. You were talking about the kind of monetization that, that you, the audience like and appreciate. And also, you know, that we've had a lot of conversations around making sure the content remains authentic and, and, and to your audience. When it comes to the, the, the audience that are paying for your, your product, do you find it's the, it's, it's the same, same people, repeat people, or do you find there's new customers? And, 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 and what is it that they specifically like about the way that, that you are monetizing the, the, the product inside Roblox? Yeah, so I think in general, um, Roblox players like to show off what they have and they don't like other players to be better than them just because they spent money. So I found it very, uh, it works really well to offer the cosmetic items rather than game power-ups um, with regards to who spends the money. Um, I find it is a lot, a lot of the time, uh, a small amount of players will spend a larger portion of the money um, for instance, you'll see someone spend like 10,000 Robux, which would cost like, I think like $100 sometimes in, in a game, in like the space of an hour. And then other times you'll just see a person playing 10 Robux. And it, it's really important because what I've tried to do is accommodate all ranges of spenders. Mm -hmm. So like I'll have a product for like 10 Robux, which is like 10 cents or 5 cents to buy, where up to I've got a product for 10,000 Robux. But for that product, players get their character featured in the game. And obviously, it's just it's economy of scale because I don't want a lot of players to feature their character because then it d degrades the, how much the product's worth. So I put it up high so that the players who have the Robux, because it's not always people who have bought it, Sometimes other developers who have earned the Robux through their games, they've got plenty to spare. Yeah. So they think, oh, I want my character featured. Maybe they'll look at my character and then go try my game. Um, so yeah, it's definitely trying to accommodate for the entire scale of spending. Okay. How do you measure performance of, of your advertising and monetization? So what tools are you using on, on iCall Kids? 
Uh, well, obviously you have like the Google and Facebook analytics. So we have our Facebook and Google ghost ads and uh, Instagram is also a few, but they, they do a very good job of saying, here's exactly how many people watched it, how many people liked it, how many people commented, how many people went to your website, how many people went to your Instagram account, how many people did this and this and that. Mm -hmm. And that's very precise and I think it's really useful. And then uh, that's really, that goes across everything. So that's Google, Facebook, Instagram, as I said. Uh, and I think that we try and use that as much as we can. And then we say, okay, that went really well. And this didn't go so well. For instance, we had, we were doing a big bunch of ads at the same time. And we had this one, which we thought was going to do really well, which isn't doing so well. And then we had this one, which is a bit weird, which is doing really well. And I think we've still got that one going. And it surprises you, but it's also really good intel because then you can see, okay, the ones that we didn't think were going to do so well are actually doing really well. Let's do some more of those. Okay. So before we, we get onto a few questions from the audience, just wanted to touch on moderation. And we've spoken a little bit about, about the fact that you have the, the, the content creators choosing things, but how much of your time or your company's time is, is spent moderating the content each month? Uh, all of it, all day, every day, 24 seven, because you see social media and think, okay, we're moderating that, we're moderating the comments, we're doing all of this. We're actually posting, we're doing Instagram stories, Instagram tiles, and then also obviously on the website, which everyone's working on, we're also moderating stories. We produce a, at least like a few a day, and that's moderating, because that's you putting them out, and they're all, we have about 4,000 original articles now, and each of them keep pumping out every single day, mm -hmm. and that's our way of moderating, so we do it 24-7. And do you think there's another way to, to moderate content, or do you think it just has to be, be done manually? I think it's just manually. Yeah, if there is, it's, this is probably the best way, and this is probably the one that we like the most because it's very controllable. Yeah, okay. And obviously Roblox, are, you know, being an open platform and a great big place where lots of people are talking, how do you, how do you make sure that, that your audience, which is so valuable to you for, for the ongoing success of, of, of what you produce, kept in a place that you feel is appropriate. Is there anything that, that you use or you do to make sure that audience is, is, is safe and looked after? Well, because Roblox is predominantly or totally designed for kids, Roblox has an entire moderation um, suite of tools which they incorporate everywhere on the website. So comments are moderated. Um, there's a report button everywhere you go on the site. If someone, you can report a user for anything from exploiting in a game to inappropriate con like inappropriate chat or even being bullying, uh, being stuff like that. And that integrates with their games itself. So Roblox has a built-in chat system which you can use, which is used in almost every game on Roblox. That will link, connect up to the site. So if you block a user on the site, they'll be blocked inside the game as well, so you won't see them chat. Um, and the great thing about that is that because Roblox does so much on the moderation side, I can really focus a lot on the game development, that I don't need to spend really any time mm -hmm. going and making sure that my community is safe, because Roblox does so much of that itself. Um, the most I'll do is I'll check the Roblox group for my game, and maybe occasionally like the conversation will turn not, not to like somebody will just be start being unfriendly, or someone will start advertising their own game, yeah. or someone will just start spamming a hey I want Robux. That that's the the extent I'd go to moderate because everything else is handled by Roblox. Mm -hmm. And on, um, on I Call Kids, obviously, you, you touched on this earlier, but, but the idea, oh, cool is in the name, so the content has to be cool, and you're moderating against inappropriate content, and you, you have your 10-second rule of, of what is cool. You know, how, how, how do you make sure that that, that is, is very much the heart, from, from your eyes, because it, it started from you doing things and being interesting, and your family being interesting. How, how do you make sure that kind of stays as, as the ethos and everything you put out there? Well, you should see our whiteboard because it's got so many lists of things that we should really say highlighted on. Uh, but also at school, I look on it every day, say this is really cool, I like this. Like That happens most of the time, which is generally a good thing. Uh, and so I'll be able to see wherever I am. Like, I've got the thing on my phone. I can just go on it and say, oh, I like this, I like this, which I really should be saying for everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know one of the questions that, that got asked to Dylan beforehand was around what are what are kids playing right now? And I, I was thinking that that's probably a good question for, for you guys to answer. But also, so what right now is is cool outside of iCool Kids? You know, what what games and products do, are your peers playing? And what's not not cool? 
Uh, honestly, I think the fact thing is quite surprising. Well, what I found f quite surprising, that's quite cool. I like experiences. So you used to be, hey, what do you want for Christmas? Oh, I want a phone. Everyone says that. Yeah. But now you say, hey, do you want for, what do you want for Christmas? Oh, I want to go on a Segway class, or I want to do like a three-day DJing course, or I want to do this rock course, or I want to learn the guitar or something. It's more of a skill or an experience than an actual gift. Okay, interesting. And what about you? What do you, do you find is... is it's performing really well. I know Fortnite is out there and all the, these other games. It's yeah, so, because I'm predominantly in game development and around games, um, Fortnite is massive at the moment. Um, I'm, I've even taken a look at it to see how, what its monetization strategies are because it's doing really well in that area. And if a game's doing well, I mean, I can learn from it. Mm. Um, I think, like, to touch on Fortnite, it's so big because it's it's free. Anybody can play it, and it's cross-platform as well. So not only can anybody play it, you can play it if you have an iOS phone, um, PC, Mac, Xbox, PS4. So its starting audience is so broad, and it's a fun game to play. And I think the next game, the next big game, is definitely going to be online multiplayer because single-player games only have a certain lifespan. Mm. Because on a single-player game, you generally have to create all the content yourself. Whereas with a multiplayer game online, you give the players the tools and every game will be different. Um, so yeah, definitely online multiplayer, I think, will be, uh, become a huge part. I mean, it already is a huge part, but it will definitely even grow even more. Excellent. I have a ton more questions, but we have been given a very short warning, so I'll put Q&As out to, to the audience. I actually have a ton of questions for Jink, but I'm not going to ask them all. Maybe I can <laughs> find you afterwards. Um, just a couple. I just, I'm curious about your team, your staff, how many people and the ages? Uh, well, they're all ages here. We've got one of them here. Wave. Hello. Uh, and so they're all like uh, 20 to 30 who's a uh, 30-year-old has just gone, actually. And so we have also have mini-interns, uh, who are mini-interns, as I said. Uh, so they're from ages 12 to 16, and they'll come in for work experience. And instead of them actually writing the articles with, uh, they, obviously, they will write articles, but the re main reason we have them there is for them to go through the website, and we just watch them. I mean, it sounds a bit weird when you say it out loud, but we just watch where they go, what their mouse does, which stories they go to, which ones they read, which ones they just glance past. Mm and where they go, and then that obviously helps us because then we can see where people are actually going. And then also they can say, for instance, one came in and it's like, no one says the word epic anymore. That's just weird, get that out. No one says that. So then now you won't find the word epic on our website. <laughs> wow. uh, and that's, that's one of them. Also, and then interns who are aged uh, as normal interns and they come in on the summers and yeah. Okay, do you monetize any other way than ads? Uh, well, affiliate programs. So, uh, if you don't know what if you don't know what affiliate programs are, so if we write about con uh, if we write a story about uh, Vans, Converse, and Nike are the main three that we have, then you go through our link to Amazon and you can buy it on Amazon. Then we get ten percent of however much, or around ten percent of however much that is. Uh, but ads are yes, the main one. Okay, and then lastly, have you thought about an app versus the website, or do you find that the website is the better platform than? Uh, what I've just figured out is there's this thing that you can do on Safari and you go onto the website and you can actually make it an app and you can make it an app. So we've, I don't think many people know about that, which is quite annoying, but I've done it on my phone and I posted it on Instagram so everyone else can do it, which is, that's basically the shortcut and the free way to make an app and it just goes straight to the website and it's fine. Uh, but we have thought about it. <laughs>